Okay, hello everyone. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, this recording was originally done uh, for the Silverback Summit, uh, the recent online event. And I wanted to re-record it today in a more expanded version where I had a bit more time to dig into some topics and get into this key area of interest for me, uh, which is a, a, what I do a lot of day to day, which is troubleshooting TRT, even when it's done wrong by someone else, or if there are issues coming up that aren't quite straightforward. So this is what we're going to be unpacking today. So there are four key areas that I have identified that are the main areas of concern when it comes to troubleshooting TRT. Firstly, the gap between the expectation and reality of treatment. This is a big one. TRT builds the foundation, but not the house. I've covered this in my War and Masculinity Lecture number one and number two. Uh, number two, if it hasn't been released yet on the channel, it will be soon. This is a key area because guys need to understand that TRT does not do the work for you. It merely gives you the opportunity to correct the damage done from your previous hypergonadal state. Now, depending on where you're at in your journey, both with your health and in life in general, this may be something that takes months or this may be something that takes years. But most importantly, the time span that it takes is an area of time that allows you to do the work that needs to be done. So the further you are off track, the more work and consequently, the more time it's going to have to get you back on track. And a lot of the time, guys don't understand that you have to meet the medication halfway. It will not turn you into the man that you want to be unless you work with it. That's number one. Number two, the unresolved root cause of the hypogonadism. In this context, we're talking about secondary hypogonadism. So if the body is actively suppressing testosterone production, so you've got suppressed gonadotropins, it is not primed to metabolize and utilize optimal levels of testosterone. So if your body is in a secondary hypergonadal state and you start injecting the optimal amount of testosterone that you think that your body should have, you are injecting that into an environment which your body is actively trying to avoid and therefore is not going to metabolize it in the same way as if, as if you were in good optimal health and you would be making those levels if you could. That is one of the biggest key overarching areas when it comes to troubleshooting what's going on here. And there's a lot of things that fall under the category of this, which we're going to unpack further. So the analogy that I would use here is that this is like putting a sports car engine into an old bomb and not servicing the rest of the car or teaching the owner how to drive. I'm very careful not to judge or criticize people for crashing their car if they were never taught how to drive. So if you are off track and you don't know what you did wrong to get so far off track, that's okay. But you still need to learn those things and get back on track because otherwise there's no path forward. So you need to learn how to drive the car and have your car fixed. The TRT will fix the car for you, but it's not going to prevent you from crashing it again. So you need to learn how to drive. And most importantly, if you're now getting a car with a bigger, more powerful engine, it can do more damage if you don't drive it right. So you need to look after yourself properly. If you want to have the optimal testosterone levels that you could possibly make as a man at your age, you need to be in the optimal health that you would be making those levels if you could. And you can use TRT to help expedite the process to accelerate and enhance the work that you put in relative to your hypogonadal baseline state. So now you are going to get the results that you deserve from your training. You're going to get the results that you deserve from your nutrition to be able to get you from where you are now to where you want to be. Thirdly, undiagnosed or chronic medical conditions which are, are not properly managed. This is a big one. Uh, my friend, Dr. Charles Barnes, who's a, a member of this group and, and has been since before I was in this group, um, he has a saying, which is, uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And applied to TRT, this is how a lot of TRT practitioners, as well as patients, approach this. So if you have Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, it doesn't matter how much testosterone you throw at it, you are still going to be hypothyroid. There are so many issues like this that guys try to out testosterone, which doesn't work. So if your negative symptoms are not coming from low testosterone themselves, throwing more testosterone at the problem isn't going to solve it. And it's very important that someone takes a comprehensive look at what's going on to work out what that underlying issue is. If you take your car to the mechanic, you're not going to go, hey, my car's making this noise. And the mechanic goes, oh, yep, that's that. Okay, we'll swap that out. Fix it. Cool. See you later. 
That's how a lot of doctors treat the human body, but it's not even how a mechanic would treat your car. So what you need to do is just like what a mechanic would do, pop the bonnet, check everything out, work out what's going on, and maybe something over here could be making the problem over there. Or maybe something over here could have caused the problem over there, and this is the first symptom of that problem. The human body is much more interconnected in that fashion than people give it credit for. Number four, shit protocols. We cover this in the group all the time. There's a lot of content on this YouTube channel. There are a lot of talks at the Silverback Summit online uh, database on this topic. I'm not going to get too into this area because it's been done. All the fact fantastic practitioners who've contributed to this channel have got a slew of videos un uh, unpacking each of these individual areas that you can look into more. So number one, expectation versus reality. There's a lot of content to get through here today. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. So TRT is often marketed and sold as a panacea to a myriad of physical and mental health problems. This is what we see all the time with TRT clinics. Now, I would argue that TRT helps with a lot of things. I would argue that higher testosterone would help in most situations, not just in health, but in life for men. But it is not the magical cure for all of life's problems or all of your problems with health. And it's very important to understand that. While TRT is undoubtedly a tool to help resolve issues, a tool to help resolve issues, there are generally two sets of symptoms in hypogonadal men, symptoms which are primary and secondary to the hormone deficiency. So let's look at this for an example. So for primary symptoms, we could have sexual dysfunction, libido issues. A secondary issue could be uh, performance anxiety sexually and intimacy issues around the relationship as a result of this. Primary issue could be metabolic issues causing obesity. Secondary issues could be anxiety and depression as a result of one, low self-esteem, and two, not being able to fix the problem when you apply the work and effort to it. So it's important to understand that while TRT will fix the primary issues over time, and they do require work, the secondary issues may be things that require more out-of-the-box thinking or holistic thinking to actually resolve because we do often need to make interventions to fix an issue which has gone wrong. So it is crucial to understand that while TRT may flip the switch on biological issues directly impacted by testosterone, it can take months and years of work to undo the damage to the body and the mind from a prolonged low testosterone state and poor self-care, which can come as a result, which can also be the initial root cause. And this is what I would call a vicious cycle. I believe it can also be defined as a positive feedback loop, but that makes it sound like a good thing. So I call it a vicious cycle. So for example, we don't know what the chicken or the egg is if you look after yourself like shit and you have low testosterone, because you may be looking after yourself like shit because you feel awful, and then you feel awful because you look after yourself like shit. And it becomes this vicious cycle. We don't know what the chicken or the egg is. And it's very important to understand that if you fix the testosterone deficiency, you have to fix your habits. You have to fix either the, the, the stuff that got you here in the first place or the maladaptive coping mechanisms that have come from you being in a hypogonadal state for so long. So TRT does not do the work for you. It allows you to receive the results you deserve and nothing more. It is very important. It will give you the results. It will give you the outputs based on your inputs relative to what they should be for a healthy man. That's it. The honeymoon euphoria of motivation and drive is a dragon which can't be chased. That's been covered a lot on this channel as well. So again, TRT does not work properly without creating a human being who would naturally have optimal testosterone levels. It is paramount for patients to understand how much work, effort, and time are required to meet their expectations. This is what you see in practice when you work with clients and patients on this day in and day out. So for people who are saying, well, where's the mechanistic study? Where's the randomized control trial that shows this? It's going outside and saying the sky is blue. This is the problem. And these are the things that if you don't rectify, they're going to lead to a whole bunch of problems down the track anyway. So you have nothing to lose by fixing them. TRT unlocks a capacity to achieve results. It does not deliver a full potential of treatment without the patient meeting the medicine halfway. You will feel better if you just do everything you're doing now and optimize your testosterone levels. But going from a two out of 10 to a three out of 10 isn't resolving the issue. It's just going from less shit to shit. So it's important to understand that if you have expectations in your head of being the best version of yourself, the most 
masculine, the most whatever you want to call it, the most alpha. You, you, you might have different words or different labels that you put on this expectation of the man that you want TRT to help you become. It's not going to do it for you. It's going to make you that man as a result of the work you do while you've got the chronic exposure to the circulating antigens. It is how it works in practice. TRT will not force the body into becoming an optimal, an optimally androgenic and high testosterone man. If the chronic diet and lifestyle patterns are not congruent with this, there will be just as many side effects as benefits as the body is in an unnatural state. So if you're trashing your body, if you're overweight, if you're drinking, and then you've got the testosterone levels of 21-year-old Giga Chad, it's not going to turn you into 21-year-old Giga Chad. You're going to have problems. If you've got a piece of shit old bomb car, and you put a Lamborghini engine in it and don't do anything else, you're not going to have a Lamborghini and it's going to fall apart. So TRT takes at least six to 12 months to stabilize. Optimal levels to begin with take full effect and years, months and years to manifest. So what the way that I break it down is like this. We can put all the different categories of symptom resolution from TRT into, let's say, you know, a, like different bars and a bar graph. So we might have sexual function, we might have uh, mood, energy, strength in the gym, let's say, hypothetically. So if we put all those into different categories, what I'm saying is at about six months time, all of those bars should have started to move up, but they will move up at different paces. But what guys need to understand is that if you're like eight weeks, 16 weeks into this, and you've been hypergonadal your whole life or for like over a decade, you're not going to have the optimal sexual function, physical function, mental health, all these different things that come from having high testosterone levels in a few months. The acute effects and the chronic effects on who you are, both physically and mentally, take way longer than people realize. Puberty takes a long time to turn a boy into a man. TRT takes a long time to take you from the hypergonadal person you were previously into the version that you're wanting to become. So, Patients must understand that the benefits lie in chronic androgen exposure rather than the acute subjective benefits, as I just said. Many of the benefits of TRT come from the trajectory shift resulting from increased energy, more resilience to stress, and improved recovery. People often ask me, what's one of the main benefits of going on TRT? And I say, starting your own business. That's just what I see a lot of. Um, learning the, the disposition towards wanting to learn martial arts. That comes up a lot. Um, so it's very important to understand here that the benefits that we're, we're looking to get from TRT are beyond the biological short-term benefits in terms of how you feel day to day. It's more about going, okay, if we change the trajectory of how you think and how you act and how you respond to stresses, what is going to be the sum of all of those decisions you make and things you do over the years to come, as opposed to potentially the destructive or negative decisions that you could have made when presented with the same opportunities in a hypergonadal state. That is one of the most exciting things about TRT is not how is this going to make me feel when the medication peaks in my system after a couple of days. It's where is this going to take me? And I think that's very exciting. So things for practitioners to consider. Inform clients of a prolonged timeline for results, lifelong dependence, responsibility with adhering to protocols and blood testing instructions. So many people post in groups with no fucking idea how to do TRT because they either didn't listen or they weren't told how to do it in the first place. Guys need to understand that TRT creates a lifelong dependence. Now, if you do a PCT or if you stop taking your treatment within X months, will you recover 100% of your natural production? The research says yes. The practice says maybe. So I think that people should look at this as a lifelong treatment unless something goes drastically wrong and you have to pull the, pull the ripcord. It's important to understand the responsibility of adhering to the protocol as well. It's very important that people follow instructions. And if you don't trust the person who gives you the instructions, you need to find someone that you trust. You cannot just go on YouTube or go on Facebook groups and do hormone optimization therapy yourself. It's not something that you can do. I do not go on YouTube and watch videos of mechanics and then go rip apart my car and expect to be able to service my car myself. It's just not something that actually works. So find a practitioner that you trust and follow the advice that you're given. Educate clients on the importance of becoming healthy overall to look and feel the way they're wanting to and ensure they understand that testosterone is not a magic pill. I think a lot of the time practitioners and clinics over deliver in promises and they remove the 
onus on the client or the patient to do the work required to actually meet the expectations or to receive the benefits of the therapy in the first place. Have a referral network of personal trainers, coaches, and specialists to refer out to and to correspond directly with allied providers to work as a team. Have, if someone's overweight, have someone you can send them to to help them lose weight. Don't expect them to do this on their own. So find people that you can link your clients or patients up with to help them execute what you've told them to do. Considerations for patients. The men who you look up to are the way they are as a result of long-term habits to maintain and thrive on optimal androgen levels combined with chronic exposure to androgens. The further off track you are, the more time and work you will require to get back on track. More testosterone supplements and medication will not solve or allow you to get away with diet and lifestyle problems. You can't out biohack poor diet and lifestyle. It doesn't work. You might be able to run away from some of the negative symptoms in the short term, but they will catch up with you in the long term. Okay, getting into the second point now, unresolved root cause of secondary hypogonadism. This is a big one. And I also added to this unresolved maladaptive coping mechanisms to the physical and mental effects of low testosterone, especially if testosterone is low during formative developmental years. One thing that I'm very passionate about, and I've had some great conversations with my friend, Dr. Adam Hotchkiss about this, who was, I believe, recently on this channel, is that we deal with a very challenging and difficult set of identity problems and mood disturbances in men who grew up without optimal testosterone levels during development. I think this leads to a lot of learned fear. I think this leads to a lot of issues around self-esteem. But I also think, as I mentioned before, around trajectory, I think not having the peak androgen levels that you need to give you a drive to want to take on the world and leave your mark in the world and go out and do brave things and overcome adversity to enjoy and thrive on the challenge. If you don't have that going on for you when you're becoming who you are as an adult, I think that that can lead to a lot of potentially detrimental decisions as well as attitudes and views around where you are in the world that leads to mental health issues as you get older. Many of the side effects of TRT are due to the biological consequences of chronic inflammation, which would naturally suppress the body's testosterone production combined with the high levels of exogenous testosterone. So what I mean here is that if your body is a dumpster fire and you put the optimal amount of testosterone levels of a 21-year-old, you are going to get issues directly downstream from the effects of the chronic inflammation that, that's there in the first place. So one thing, for example, that we know is that chronic inflammation, one, drives up aromatase, but two, it also impacts things like prolactin, cortisol, and it impacts your dopamine in the brain threefold. So, and people can look this up. Chronic inflammation will reduce the synthesis of dopamine. It will reduce the production of dopamine, and it will also increase the reuptake of dopamine, which means you make less, you absorb less, and you clear it out faster. This is the opposite of what stimulants do or things like amphetamines do, which give you a euphoria. So it's important to understand that if you're in chronic pain or if you've got some chronic metabolic issues that you haven't resolved, you are not going to feel good. And if you try to put a bunch of testosterone into this body, the, comp the outcome of this chronic inflammation is going to impact how the testosterone works. And it's not going to get you the results that you're looking for until you resolve the root cause of what's going wrong. These underlying pathologies impact androgen and estrogen receptor sensitivity, as I said previously, aromatase production, corticosteroid production, prolactin, reverse T3, and dopaminergic processes. These issues lead to hypertension, polycythemia, bloating, water retention, hyperhidrosis, too much sweating, mood disturbances, cognitive issues, insomnia, circulatory issues, libido issues, and digestive problems. I would put this all into a lump category of most problems that people post in TRT groups online or come to me with if they're having troubleshooting problems. So it's important to understand that identifying the root cause is only half the battle. So if you work out what the problem is, that's fantastic, but you still have to fix it. And a lot of the time, lack of compliance to what needs to be done to resolve the problem is the issue. So it may be months or years to healthily get back on track, depending on how far off track you are and depending on what the root cause is. If you look in the mirror one day and work out that you're 100 pounds overweight, that's not an instant solution. That's the start of the solution. Then you actually have to do the work and get to where you need to go. 
It's important to support and adjust the TRT protocol to reflect different baseline states of health. So for example, if you're 40 years old, morbidly obese and an alcoholic, the optimal testosterone, the optimal physiological level of testosterone for you is not going to be the same as a 40 year old who's eaten the perfect diet for three decades straight has 10% body fat and looks after himself immaculately. One, if, if you take them up to the same level, the level that is optimal for the second guy is going to be super physiological for the first guy until he fixes the health issues that would be limiting his testosterone production. So what a super physiological level for someone is and for someone else is, age is a factor, but health is a factor as well. Here's some common root causes, obesity, alcoholism, SSRIs and antipsychotics, chronic pain and intractable injuries, previous and androgenic anabolic steroid use, especially prior to the age of 25. These are just the things that I've seen. These are anecdotal. Exposure to xenoestrogens during development, obesity during puberty, poor diet, lifestyle and health of parents in utero, micronutrient deficiencies, chronic psychological stress, sleep deprivation, including sleep apnea, hypothyroidism and drug use. And unfortunately, that includes cannabis. So supplements, which can help. So I'm putting these in here for people who are like, what's a Band-Aid I can use if I recognize that I need to fix the root cause issue, but I need something to help put some pep in my step so that I can actually get to where I need to go. These are not solutions. These are things that help in the short term. They do not do the work for you. I do not sell any of these supplements. You can get them off iHerb or Amazon or wherever the hell you buy supplements. And Acatelcysteine, like this should be liposomal glutathione, phosphatidylserine, KSM66 or sensoril ashwagandha, rhodiola rosea, those two are great combined. Uh, CBD, Tudka, melatonin, glucosamine with MSM, ubiquinol, and high quality and high dose omega-3 fish oil. These all synergize very well. Please speak to your practitioner or whoever is coaching you in your health around whether any of these supplements would be suitable for you before you take them and which supplements would be more beneficial for you over others. Different people will benefit from different things depending on what is going on with them. Medications which can help in the short term, Tadalafil, Metformin, Telmosartan. I'm not too big on pharmaceuticals. I'm not going to get into these, but they have been unpacked further on the channel. Interventions that can help. I am much more interested in what you can do, not what you can take. So losing body fat, personal training, increased cardio, meal prep services, counseling, mindfulness meditation, various forms of resistance training, self-development practices, losing body fat. I put this in three times intentionally. Comprehensive blood testing and assessment, personal coaching, removing vices, especially alcohol, drugs, and junk food. Those three are the biggest vices that are fucking everyone up. Increasing low-intensity daily movement, high-quality nutritional-based supplements, and losing body fat. Patients and providers, this is a summary recommendation for both parties to take into consideration. So firstly, this is the big one. I feel like a broken record when I say this, but I'm going to say this for the one millionth time. Comprehensive, in-depth blood work and medical history analysis must be performed to ensure optimal HRT protocols and ongoing management. Do complete comprehensive blood work before you go on TRT and do complete comprehensive blood work after you start TRT. A lot of the time people do neither and a lot of the time people do one or the other. Do both, comprehensive blood work. Most complications I have worked with to resolve with clients have been oversights. For me, they're only running narrow blood work, so only looking at you know androgens and red blood cells, or not spending enough time to understand the patient's medical history. I spend an hour with my clients to work out what's going on, and even sometimes that's barely enough time. So your practitioner needs to know the important things which impact your health, and they need to give you the time or the platform to give them that information so that they can take these things into consideration. If a provider is not skilled with interpreting <clears throat> all, all hormones and comprehensive metabolic panels, they should learn to see the red flags on blood work and refer to allied providers. You do not need to be a jack of all trades, but you need to be able to understand where there might be an issue so that you can refer out to someone who has more expertise than you. Patients must not attempt to solicit personalized medical advice from Facebook groups. I'm going to repeat that. Patients must not attempt to solicit personalized medical advice from Facebook groups. It's not because providers are trying to make as much money off you as possible. It is because it is impossible, impossible 
for strangers to diagnose and treat medical conditions, and for you as a patient to know every aspect which is relevant to your symptoms and side effects. When people post looking for advice on social media, they always neglect major areas which they don't realize are relevant, and it makes the whole process the blind leading the blind. Use social media groups for education, not diagnosis. So TRT will not solve problems which cannot be directly resolved by increasing androgen levels in and of itself, as I said before. Again, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. TRT is not a panacea. The big, and we're, we're going to go into these ones in particular now. So insulin resistance and obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or alcoholic fatty liver disease, hypothyroidism, chronic pain and psychological issues, are, which are often diagnosed as anxiety and depression, are the five most common conditions I see which complicate TRT. Now, I've done separate videos on the anxiety and depression part, so I'm going to cover the previous four. Again, am I saying these are the objectively most common things? No, I'm saying this is what I see the most. It is common for men to try and biohack their way around these issues or through the issues, whether consciously or unconsciously, whether, sorry, however, if the root cause is resolved, there will always be some degree of dysfunction and reliance on coping practices. So for example, I meet guys who have every aspect of their diet and lifestyle dialed in to the point that it's become neurotic just to stay at a six out of 10. And if they don't comply with doing everything 100% perfectly, they feel dreadful. That is not a solution. That is a band-aid. It's a coping mechanism. And you need to work out with a practitioner what's going on. It is impossible to feel your best mentally without being in optimal physical health. So without getting too esoteric and woo-woo here, your body is a series of interconnected systems. Your brain is connected to every part of your body and every part of your body is connected to your brain. You are having a biological experience being alive as part of the experience of what your consciousness is. Therefore, if you are physically unhealthy or physically unwell, you are also going to be mentally unhealthy and mentally unwell. It is very important to understand that just because you don't understand the connection between your mental health symptoms and your physical health sy symptoms doesn't mean that they're not connected. So focus on improving the areas which you know need to be improved. For example, if, you're, if you've got heaps of chronic pain in your body and muscle tightness and stiffness and you're anxious, you might not know how to fix the anxiety, but you probably know how to stretch. So work on the things that you do know how to work on, and you might find that the other symptoms resolve. So look at what's going on objectively that you need to improve. Generally, people know either what they're doing they shouldn't be doing or what they're not doing they should be doing. Start there. So obesity and insulin resistance. So this is measured by a body fat percentage, fasting insulin, and HbA1c, depending on who you talk to. Further markers of dysfunction are elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit, hypertension, elevated triglycerides, elevated prolactin, sleep apnea, depression, and anxiety. There's all kinds of other issues that come from being overweight. I'm just listing a few. Being overweight causes varying degrees of insulin resistance, which interrupts the body's ability to burn glucose for energy as well as accessing stored body fat for fuel, especially if it leads to fatty liver disease, which we're going to cover next. So being overweight is stressful on the body. It's like having too big of a, a car body for a small engine to run. So when you have insulin resistance, you are disrupting your body's ability to, to generate energy in the mitochondria properly. And this is an inherently biological stressful process. This causes chronic stress via overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. So it is stressful for your body to maintain energy reserves. So you get more of a stress response from doing things that shouldn't require that, i.e. you're unfit walking around day to day. And as the body is constantly struggling to generate and utilize cellular energy. So this leads to further oxidative stress neuronally and leads to further imbalance in the GABA and glutamate pathways. You can look up for, for examples of this, you can look at the protective mechanisms, uh, sorry, the neuroprotective uh, mechanisms of metformin. So we're looking here at imbalance in the GABA and glutamate pathways, resistance to dopamine via reduced uh, production, synthesis, and increased uptake, as I mentioned previously, causing a, a chronic state of low mood and heightened stress and anxiety. Low dopamine plus high cortisol is an awful state of mind to be in. It is an awful neurochemical foundation to operate in and it is the baseline state 
of people who would be symptomatic of both anxiety and depression. And it is also physiologically contributed to by insulin resistance. So proper education around nutrition, exercise, and stress management and self-care must be undertaken. It is crucial that people understand exactly how they got off track and how much work is required to fix the issue. There's no help. There's no point in helping someone get back on track if they're just going to fall right back off. They need to understand why they fell back off in the first place. Otherwise, they're going to fall right back off again. They also need to have a purpose for not getting off track again. So it's crucial that people understand exactly how much how they got off track and how much work is required to fix the issue. That's the other part. People need to understand that if they're morbidly obese or they've got some really severe you know, physical fitness issues, an hour a week in the gym is not going to fix it. Two hours a week in the gym is not going to fix it. There is generally far more work than people realize that they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to resolve their issues, which is a lot of the time why they give up because the results are too slow. Always perform testing on thyroid and DHEA as well as other markers for chronic stress, such as work or interval pain from injuries. So check if people are psychologically stressed work or relationships. And also check for multiple pain. So DHEA thyroid replacement will expedite results if there is a deficiency. So people who are chronically stressed can sometimes have either permanent, again, vicious cycle, chicken or the egg, or transient deficiencies in both DHEA and thyroid. So it's important to look into that. Phosphatidyl, and that is not telling people to just take these hormones willy-nilly. I'm just going to put that in there. It should go without saying, but please work with a provider on this. DHEA and thyroid replacement will expedite results if there is a deficiency. Phosphatidyl serine and KSM-66 ashwagandha are very helpful in doses of 300 to 600 milligrams of each per day for individuals in chronically stressed situations, including intractable injury pain. For anyone who is afraid of ashwagandha and its impact on the serotonergic system, I advise you to actually read the study that that hypothesis is based off and come to the conclusion yourself as to whether that is a reasonable thing. I, again, I do not recommend these supplements unless you objectively have markers for chronic stress, which has been identified and diagnosed by a practitioner, not by Google. NAC 600 to 1200 milligrams twice daily improves mood and energy levels in the short term while body fat is being reduced due to improving the GABA and glutamate ratio neurologically. That last part is a fact. The application of using it to help with mood for people who are overweight is something I have noticed and agree. I am doing my best to distinguish in this what is uh, subjective observations and what is based in uh, the literature so that people don't cry in the comments. Um, mixed forms of vitamin E, ubiquinol, and two to four grams of combined EPA, DHA per day can also be helpful with mood issues caused by chronic inflammation and insulin resistance. I did mention high quality fish oil before. I'm going to make the comment again because I know that someone's going to cry in the comments. I'm not going to read the comments, by the way. It is important to get high quality fish oil because fish oil absolutely can oxidize. But for the people who think that like 30 or 40% of all fish oil is, is rancid based on the study that was done, read the study that was done. It is not a very high quality piece of literature at all, barely even call it a study, but it has always been important to get high quality, non-oxidized and non-rancid fish oil. I personally use the sports research, triple strength Omega. I have no affiliation with that brand. Short-term use of metformin may also be indicated and beneficial if tolerated. So again, you can check out uh, Jay Campbell's work on metformin, which I think is the best resource. He has a fantastic paper he's written. I believe it's called The Definitive Guide to Metformin. You can Google that one. Um, okay, getting into alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I have a full uh, liver masterclass on my friend Danny Boss's channel. I am going to skim through this part here, but if you would like to unpack it further, I suggest you watch that video. So number one, an ultrasound won't tell us if it's alcoholic or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that will generally come up from diet and lifestyle, but you can. Yeah. Oh, sorry, my video. I'm going to refer to, to NAFLD and, and FLD interchange of elevated bond is used. Uh, ALD and AST must may also be elevated, but are not always. So in my experience, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Uh, 
gamma GT is usually elevated in alcoholic fatty liver disease because of the acute effects of the alcohol, or if NAFLD has advanced to a point that it is quite severe. Again, these are just my observations. If you read a study that says otherwise, good view. NAFLD can be the root cause of insulin resistance and obesity rather than only being caused by insulin resistance and obesity. So I need to find what I mean there. It is a myth that NAFLD is caused by obesity only. NAFLD can actually uh, preface the metabolic dysfunction. And you can Google that. That is literature. So I believe, this is my observation, that it is due to a choline deficiency mechanistically based on how it forms if it's not formed from being overweight. So that is my theory. Uh, that is purely anecdotal. So NAFLD will prevent insulin resistance from being resolved. So as I said before, if the NAFLD came before the insulin resistance, then how is losing weight going to fix NAFLD? It doesn't. So NAFLD will prevent insulin resistance from being resolved. It's kind of like you hit a brick wall when you're trying to get your body fat lower past a point. Uh, due to increasing gluconeogenesis and disrupting fatty acid metabolism. Again, this fucks with your metabolism. So you have an increased muscle protein breakdown so that your body can keep your blood sugar levels elevated because you don't burn fat properly. It is a awful condition to be in if you're trying to lose weight, which is why it is important to have your liver checked if you are overweight to make sure there won't be any with your weight loss. It will also disrupt liver detoxification processes and may lead to a decreased clearance of xenobiotics and xenoestrogens, uh, as well as a reduction in T4 to T3 conversion. So just lose weight does not work as NAFLD can be the root cause of why the person was overweight to begin with. NAFLD does, uh, often does not resolve itself and prevents the weight loss from occurring. Generally, people will say, oh, just leave it or it'll go away on its own. No, you want to fix it. Otherwise, it will progress and get worse. Potentially, it will turn into cirrhosis or liver cancer. So again, I don't sell any of these supplements. I don't sell any of these protocols. You can just get them on Amazon or iHerb. I tend to use the Now Food uh, brand for this one. That's just what I tend to use. You can use whatever you want. So choline and inositol work very effectively over an 8 to 12 period to clean fat out of the liver state. Again, this is just what I've known in practice. If you don't want to follow this protocol because there is not a peer study on it, then don't do it. So milk this that can all be used to support well-being and liver function by removing fat from us. So the, I didn't word this well. Colon and other parts in the liver, milk filled tutka glute will help support the liver while it's functioning well. 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of each choline inositol twice daily for 8 to 12 weeks is often sufficient to remove fat from the liver if healthy diet and lifestyle practices are adhered to. I'm going to make a caution here. This is not telling you how to fix fatty liver yourself. This is a guidepost for practitioners to research or for you as the patient to research and discuss with your practitioner. This is not a prescription for a fatty liver protocol. And this is not a direction to go on iHerb or Amazon and take these supplements without any supervision. This is something to prescribe with, uh, to discuss with your prescribing practitioner or for prescribing practitioners to look into. Again, these are just suggestions. I'm not telling you to take this. This is purely for educational purposes. If diarrhea uh, is present, uh, split the dosage into three to four doses per day to allow the amount of choline and inositol to be taken per day. Um, otherwise, you'll need to reduce the dose. But again, this should be the important to tutka and ox bile to meal because otherwise fat will not be digested properly and you will not assimilate by ETK and cholesterol. So again, much more content in my liver masterclass. Uh, you can check that out on Danny Boss's channel. So hypothyroidism. So subclinical hypothyroidism, Justin Gross has great videos on the channel. I know that some other guys do as well, but from memory, I just remember Justin. So heaps and heaps of great content on hypothyroidism. You guys can go and watch some other videos on that if you want to learn more. This is going to be painting a pretty broad stroke over this topic. So subclinical hypothyroidism can be caused by hypogonadism. Hypogonadism can be caused by hypothyroidism. So which is the lowest hanging fruit? ask your practitioner. That is their job to assess. It is important to determine thyroid status before starting TRT as there is a significant crossover between low thyroid and low testosterone symptoms. So if you put on the left a list of hypothyroid symptoms and you put on the right a list of low testosterone symptoms, you will find that they're like a Venn diagram that has a very large amount of crossover in the middle. 
thyroid is less invasive than TRT. It does not shut down your, your thyroid gland completely like testosterone shuts your testicles down. And resolving severe hypothyroidism has been shown in literature and in practice to cause a resolution of hypogonadism. So if the, if the hypothyroidism is severe or the hypogonadism is mild, it may be alleviated by fixing the thyroid. However, it's important to note that TRT won't fix Hashimoto, which is an autoimmune condition. Therefore, low testosterone can cause low thyroid and low thyroid can cause low testosterone. So it's very common for guys who have very low testosterone levels to also have mild subclinical hypothyroidism, which does tend to resolve in three to six months, sometimes 12, depending on what's going on. That's why sometimes it's important to do things together synergistically, but other times it's important to do things one thing at a time. So I recommend, and again, this is just a template and a rule of thumb, if the hypothyroidism is mild, to introduce the TRT first in case that causes an uptick in thyroid activity to prevent overactive thyroid levels. Again, this is just my experience. It's for people to research and do with what they will. So it's important to understand that both low thyroid and low testosterone can be second and can be caused by malnutrition, chronic pain, stress, psychiatric medications, and lifestyle practices. So all of this can be induced by diet and lifestyle and therefore be resolved by diet and lifestyle, but not all the time. And that's why it's very important for your practitioner to make an assessment based on your symptoms and your history of which one came first, the low hormone values or the poor diet and lifestyle. And if it's not clear, which a lot of the time it's not, which is the best path forward for the individual based on where they're at. So just like with hypogonadism, it is important to determine whether the poor diet and lifestyle practices are maladaptive coping mechanisms to the disease state or whether the disease state is induced by the poor diet and lifestyle. How do you do this? You don't do it on Google. You don't do it as someone who does this day in and does for you. So always run verse T3 and thyroid antibodies if a full picture of the thyroid function is needed. So when in doubt, test not guess. That's a quote from uh, Chris Gresser. Waking temperatures being below 97.8 to 98.2. So that's the range that people believe that they should be in. Uh, can be a secondary indicator for hypothyroidism. It's important to note, though, that there are so many other factors that will impact your body temperature. So waking temperature is not a be-all and end-all of whether you need to take more thyroid or whether you have hypothyroidism. NAFLD can also be caused by hypothyroidism and it can also be induced by hypothyroidism. So caused by hypothyroidism and it can cause hypothyroidism itself. So again, these pathologies can be related and sometimes you need to fix both to break the cycle. And when I say you need to, I don't mean that you need to in terms of going online and doing whatever the fuck you want. It's what your practitioner who has expertise in is going to guide you on. It's important for patients to understand that the hypothyroidism causes them to have a slow metabolism. This is where calories out calculators can be drastically incorrect and patients have become despondent and discouraged. I can't count the amount of times that my clients have come to me previously berated by their personal trainers, told that they were incompetent for not tracking their sources or their milk in their coffee properly when in fact their basal metabolic calculator was way off because the personal trainer didn't understand or factor in other things for calories out, such as thyroid function. So it is very important here that clients actually have proper blood work done. And I think personal trainers to be able to give clients the cue to get comprehensive blood work done because things like a thyroid deficiency will massively reduce the calories out part of the equation. And if people feel like their lack of results are coming from a lack of effort, then they can lead to becoming despondent because they're not getting the reward for the effort that they're putting in. I find natural desiccated thyroid, again, this is just personally anecdotal. I find NDT to be more effective in practice at the equivalent T3, T4 dose, but it does cause a rash in Hashimoto's, in my experience, maybe one out of 10 people. So I prefer NDT unless it's not tolerated. Again, purely anecdotal. Uh, if people disagree with that, genuinely don't care. So thyroid should be titrated up in small increments of 30 to 60 milligrams of NDT until symptoms are resolved. Again, this is just how I do it. If you want to do it differently, then do it differently. TSH and T3 feedback loop does not always function properly. So it's important to factor that in, especially in Hashimoto's. Um, or if there's a problem with the pituitary gland, like empty cellar, always important to get a pituitary MRI done if there's multiple secondary hormonal problems. 
Uh, TSH does sometimes need to be suppressed depending on what's going on. It is important to resolve other root cause issues which may be raising TSH and reverse T3, such as chronic stress, prolonged caloric uh, restriction, chronic injuries, poor sleep, diet, and lifestyle practices. You'll see that these are reoccurring themes. Addressing stress management is key for high TSH and high reverse Hashimoto status or thyroid medication dose. So if you've got high TSH and high T3 and high reverse T3, it means that your thyroid receptors are not working due to chronic stress. And your body is trying to ramp up production to offset for this. So rather than throwing more thyroid hormone at it, reduce the stress. So phosphatidylserine, ashwagandha, CBD, glycine, theanine, magnesium, they're all effective. Try one of them. Things will work better for you than other guys. You might find that a combination of all of them work fantastic. Mindfulness meditation, stretching, mobility work, and sleep hygiene. So the supplements are not the solution. The supplements are the band. So work on whatever the root cause of the chronic stress is. A lot of the time, it's chronic injuries. It's not psychological stress. It can also be psychological stress, but very often it's chronic injuries. Introducing TRT will usually boost thyroid function a bit, as I said before. So if the hypothyroidism is mild and the hypogonadism is severe, I believe, based on my experience, it is often worth waiting three to six months into TRT to look at introducing thyroid as it may potentially solve on its own. So chronic pain. Chronic pain, in my experience, causes similar side effects to obesity with TRT due to increased systemic inflammation. I'm going to read that again. Chronic pain, in my experience, causes similar side effects to obesity when TRT is used due to increased systemic inflammation. So this is, again, just what I have observed is the overweight clients and the clients with chronic pain generally get similar sets of symptoms, but the, the treatment so the approaches for resolving the root cause as to why they're getting the negative symptoms is very different as the root cause is, is completely different. So the outcome in terms of what's happening regarding the inflammation is the same and the symptoms might be the same, but the root cause is different. And this is why things like aromatase inhibitors are not the solution. It's getting to the root cause of what's going on. And if you do need to use a Band-Aid, antioxidants and natural health-promoting anti-inflammatories can often make immensely positive impacts on mental and physical health in conjunction with TRT and prevent unfavorable metabolism or low androgen receptor binding of testosterone. This is my hypothesis. This is my anecdote. This is what I have observed. I am not making up science or studies here. This is just what I have seen. Chronic pain and inflammation is anti-dopaminergic. As I've said before, you can look up those studies. Increases prolactin. I think most people know that, uh, which is further anti-dopaminergic. Reduces thyroid function increased by increasing... Uh, T, uh, reverse T3 and dysregulates the endocannabinoid system and also severely lowers quality of life due to subjective pain. This is why CBD can be helpful, but again, not a panacea. It is important to work on the inflammation and consequences of the inflammation, two different things, with chronic pain patients to support their baseline energy levels as well as mood so that they are more compliant with rehabilitation and other forms of physical therapy to improve the root cause of the pain. If someone's in chronic pain, and they feel like shit, they're, they're not going to comply as well as they probably would like to, and then they're going to feel guilty about it. Whereas if you if you can help them feel better in the short term and put wind in their sails, especially if they've got a good purpose and drive for getting better, it often makes a huge difference in the volume they do regarding rehabilitation. So chronic pain will spread antigens, and increasing antigens can have supporting effects on pain but it will not resolve the root cause. So if you've got a slipped disc, the higher testosterone levels may make you feel better, but it will not unslip your disc. However, a more androgenic mental and physical environment is often favorable for the outcomes of physical therapy. It helps with the increased corticosteroid production of being in pain. It helps with preventing muscle wastage. It, there are a lot of benefits. I think a big subjective benefit psychologically is it helps you want to overcome the adversity that you've been given rather than being a victim about it. I think that's also a benefit too. Supplements such as CBD and CBDA, which is raw CBD, uh, glucosamine, MSM, high quality, high strength DHA, EPA, fish oil, NAC, cortisol modulators like ashwagandha. Again, very similar toolbox, very similar toolkit. Certain things will suit other people better. Discuss these with your practitioner, do your research. These can often make a drastic difference in quality of life. So if you take five things that help by let's say 5%, you feel 25% better. That can be a big difference. So these stacks 
concepts and these approaches to using things that are, are generally agreed on to be universally quite good for you and not going to cause you problems. These can be things that you can stack up to help you feel better day to day so that you go and actually do the stuff that's going to make you feel 50% or 75% better. So again, just to recap, supplements will not resolve and help body better manage the consequences of being in pain, leading to widespread subjective benefits, both mentally and physically. Always, and this is a side note for practitioners, for clients or patients who are in chronic pain, always check their pregnenolone and DHEA levels because they can become depleted. Uh, I also have found that low pregnenolone and DHEA can be implicated in fibromyalgia. Uh, glutathione and magnesium infusions can be very helpful when available. Shout out to my friend Joel in Thailand for putting me onto this combination. Uh, THC in microdoses with CBD before sleep can be very effective in supporting deep sleep and physical recovery for those with intractable pain. I'm going to put a little caveat here. THC is something which needs to be used uh, very cautiously. THC used either too much of it or by someone who uses a dose that they're too sensitive to can be psychologically distressing. Um, and people need to have this uh, supervised and discussed with extensively before they do it. I'm not advocating that everyone takes THC for this stuff. I am advocating for looking into it as opposed to using things like prescription sleeping pills. And I do recommend keeping the dose of THC as low as possible, using it as minimally as possible, while always overshadowing it with at least a one-to-one -one dose of CBD, ideally more. Shit protocols. So I'm not going to go too into this. Um, this has been covered very extensively on the channel, but I'll weigh my two cents in on these as a kind of 101 guide to troubleshooting this. So testosterone must be injected at least twice a week when using cypionate, enanthate, or sustenone preparations. When I say at least twice a week, I mean twice a week or more. Sustenone may lend itself to more frequent administration due to short-acting esters. Uh, for those in the UK, I know this is a factor. Sustenone is more popular. You can get away with using it twice a week. I would argue that more frequent injections is more beneficial due to the more pronounced peak due to the propionate, phenyl propionate, but twice a week in general is the minimum for cypionate and enanthate to get relatively stable levels. Compounded transcrotal creams can be applied once or twice per day, although twice per day is ideal. This is just my opinion. Although twice a day is ideal for stable concentrations, that's not my opinion, that's a fact. Once daily can, well, arguably would more closely mimic physiological rhythms if you want to debate it for the sake of debating it, but I would argue the benefit of a once daily application is purely that it's easier for compliance and transference issues. You're reducing the amount of work that you need to do by half and the transference issues, particularly in the evening, if you have a partner is very, very annoying. So intimacy is important. Um, and also putting these protocols into the back of your mind once you're dialed in is very important. So it doesn't rule your life. So whether twice weekly injections are easier for you or three times a week injections are better for you or once daily cream or twice daily cream, find something that is falling into that category any less often. I mean, I can't imagine you do cream less than once a day, but the dose of a once daily cream application could be too low. That's important. Um, but anything less than a twice a week injection of cypionate and anandate is too much variation on a rhythm that is not closely mimicking a man's natural biology. We want to be a stable day to day as well, not give us give ourselves uh, weekly hormonal rhythms. So men in poorer health or who have had hypogonadism for a longer period of time prior to treatment are more sensitive. This is what I've noticed more sensitive to dips in testosterone and should inject three times a week instead of twice. That's just my rule of thumb. So if someone is, more overweight or has poorer diet and lifestyle patterns, or they've got poorer mental health, I'm more likely going to recommend for them a protocol, which is a little bit more consistent because I've observed that they're guys who are more sensitive to the peaks and valleys. And I have also noticed that once guys have been on treatment for a longer period of time, they become less sensitive. And a lot of the time guys who are doing daily or every other day injections go back to three times a week or twice a week once their baseline gets used to it. I think, this is my hypothesis, that the body's default state becomes a high androgenic state and then as opposed to your previous default state being a low androgenic state. So I think that once your body has assimilated and your identity is shifted, that these variations become less noticeable because they're not triggering your negative symptoms or issues you were having prior. That is just my theory. 
I personally prefer to titrate in 20 to 30 milligram increments of testosterone weekly. So like not with weekly shots, but over the course of the week, I prefer to move up in that kind of increment in 12 to 16 week blocks. So rather than bumping someone up by 50 milligrams at a time, I would personally prefer to bump them up by 20 to 30 milligrams, 12 to 16 re- weeks, run a comprehensive panel and then do it again just to one, give them more time to adjust, but two, to make sure that I'm not over or undershooting the target that I'm trying to hit. That's just how I do it. Levels fluctuate up to 30% even with daily injections when the protocol remains the same. I think a lot of guys get quite surprised or concerned that they've got bunk gear or that something's wrong because their levels move around a bit. It's very normal. Even with daily injections, your levels are going to move in the serum. A serum is just a snapshot. Anything that impacts the liver metabolism of the ester, so the cleavage of the enanthate or cypionate or sustenum, will impact the amount of testosterone that's impact that's released into the bloodstream at any given time. It is normal for numbers to fluctuate a lot. Don't make adjustments based on the numbers in one lab reading. I feel like that's been covered to death. Your protocol is based on what this dose is for you at your age and in your current state of health. So what is optimal for a fit and lean 21-year-old and an obese 50-year-old is very different things. What is optimal for a healthy fit 21-year-old may be super physiological for that uh, obese 50-year-old. So it's very, very important to work with a practitioner who understands what your requirements are to get you to feeling the way that you want to feel and actually getting a treatment that you're happy with. I prefer, on the topic of obesity, to start obese individuals on cream, this is just me personally, rather than injections for more stability and increased DHT conversion, Increased body fat is one of the driving factors for increased aromatase expression, but it's important to understand that the body is increasing aromatase because estrogen is anti-inflammatory and it's protecting the cardiovascular system. So the solution is not to use aromatase inhibitors. It's to use a more stable, more androgenic preparation, which I found cream to be, otherwise doing daily or every other day injections and using a dose that is more in line with what an optimal individual in that current state of health would have rather than overshooting the dose and then trying to haphazardly and often ineffectively, which is what leads everyone to the forums, trying to use an aromatase inhibitor to fix the side effects. It does not work. But at the same time, putting a sports engine car into into an old bomb that needs a service doesn't work either. So if you're in a situation where you're overweight and wanting to start TRT to help get your, your life back together, I'm not saying that that should disqualify you from treatment, but I'm saying that this is something that your treatment needs to be taken into consideration but you also need to understand the amount of work and energy that you need to put into this to meet the medicine halfway and to get you to where you want to go. And this is ultimately how you avoid the side effects, which everyone is coming to either myself or other practitioners or Facebook groups to try to resolve. So MCT oil for me, uh, which is often uh, sold as migliol, uh, which is the pharmaceutical preparation for MCT, uh, is preferred for me. Uh, because it's less viscous, which means that you can push it through uh, quicker, like a smaller syringe, but it's also less immunogenic. So I see less people react negatively to it. Um, The other thing that's for a factor to to take into consideration here is that I am not saying that MCT oil or sesame oil or grapeseed oil work one time. I still do not think these injections are ideal. But for the guy who adamant doing something, thinner oils, this is just from practice, thinner oils tend to work less drug serum levels compared to intramuscular to take into consideration. That's all, everyone. If you wish to support the channel, consider becoming a channel member. And check out the links in the description of all the things I'm associated with. My ebook on compounded testosterone cream, multiple workout programs, Mizumi skincare, online pharmacy NP Labs, and a list of Amazon links to the supplements we recommend.